Thanks for coming for uh, this uh, symposium. I uh, work at the Montreal Heart Institute since uh, 1999, and my disclosures are shown here. And also, uh, my objectives are to share our experience with use of uh, right ventricular pressure monitoring since uh, 2002 at the Montreal Heart Institute, to demonstrate some practical aspect and limitation when using this type of monitoring. So I will start first by discussing of RV function. So whenever you have RV systolic impairment, there's gonna be some determinants of this condition. We talk about RV pressure, RV volume overload, or reduction in contractility, but there's gonna be some triggers, some etiology. And yesterday, for those of you who were at the Earl Wine and lecture, what we found is that one of the very important predictors is RMLI, which can lead to RV uh, dysfunction and failure. If ever you have RV systolic impairment, at one point your stroke volume will start to be reduced and you'll see RV dilatation. RV dilatation will lead to right atrial dilatation, arrhythmia, loss of your AV synchrony. And then we start to talk about RV ischemia. As RV dilatation progress, this will affect the left ventricle. And again, this will further reduce the LV uh, stroke volume, lead to hypotension and shock. And this will further deteriorate the contractility of the right ventricle. However, other things will happen in those patients. One of them is that as your right atrial pressure increase in about one of five patients, there's gonna be an opening of the PFO and hypoxemia. In addition, with the rise in the central venous pressure, you're gonna have venous congestion leading to a portal positivity. And then at this point, with refractory hypoxemia and uh, venous congestion, you'll end up with multi-organ failure, brain desaturation, and this is what we call would be right ventricular failure. So you all know the importance of right ventricular failure, right ventricular dysfunction in cardiac and in non-cardiac surgery. So what is the issue basically? Well, right ventricular function is a major determinant of survival in the OR and the ICU. There is international recognition and teams are created to tackle this important issue. And there's a natural progression from right ventricular dysfunction to right ventricular failure leading to multi-system organ dysfunction and death. Therefore, it's important to identify and reverse this process as the earliest stage as possible. So, as those of you who were there yesterday know that the reason I'm here is that when I start using echocardiography, I completely change the way I look at the hemodynamic uh, monitoring. And in fact, what we realize over the year is the importance at looking at the waveform. So if you look in the middle, you see a forest. If you look outside, you see a tree. But this painting is called the forest in the man because really what is this, the, the, the signature is the contour of the line that gives you this painting, that gives you the significance. And it's exactly the same thing when we take care of patient and when we look at our hemodynamic values. So what we realize is it's more important to look at the waveform than looking at the values. And an example I showed you the other day is that whenever you have someone who's unstable, the CVP is 17, this is a 47 woman coming off ECMO, the right atrium, the right ventricle is normal. But then you have the same CVP here of 61 year old man with post cabbage. So the value is exactly the same, but the way you make the difference is looking at the waveform. And here you have an X descent and here you have a Y descent. And it's basically the same elements that we discovered looking at the right ventricular waveform because the right ventricular pressure waveform really tells you what type of, that you have RV dysfunction and where also you are in that abnormality. So the first element that we will describe is the significance of the diastolic right ventricular pressure waveform. And we've been using since 1990 at the Heart Institute a pace board that gave us a right ventricular pressure and pulmonary artery pressure waveform. And that would work, I would say, in about 85% of the time. And most of the time, you get an, a PA and an RV pressure waveform. However, in some patients, we can get the RV. And in some, when you get the RV, you're going to wedge. And this was because the port was at 18 centimeters. So what, and, and an idea we had is that, well, we need to create a swan which has a port which is more distal, at 13 centimeters. And in fact, this is actually what the, uh, the uh, swan IQ does. And that's been our experience. We report our experience uh, last year. And uh, basically we tested in uh, 
uh, up to 149 patients. And the success rate is very, very high. In fact, the only failure we had are those patients in which we could not advance the swan into the right ventricle. But overall, uh, we were able to, write, to get RV and pressure waveform, all of them within 50 centimeter. So this is a, a review article that goes into the detail of how we use this type of catheter. How do we analyze the uh, pressure waveform by my colleague, Dr. Raymond. So when you look at the right ventricular pressure waveform, this is what the waveform will look like. So you have an end systolic, you have an end diastolic pressure, and then you're gonna have a gradient in diastole. This is the RV pulse pressure. There's a positive and there's a negative DPDT. Whenever you have RV dysfunction, what you will see is that the systolic pressure will come down, the diastolic pressure will go up, and the pulse pressure will go down. The gradient in diastole will progressively increase. The positive DPDT will be, will be abnormal, and the negative DPDT will be prolonged. And uh, to, however, if you use, if you see this on your monitor, to really get the values, what you have to do, you have to freeze your screen, measure it. And now with the IQ squan, the, 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 uh, the advantage is that those measurements, those values are automatically displayed. So what you have on top is your IV pressure waveform. And then the system gives you automatically the end diastolic pressure and the early diastolic pressure. So then you know exactly what is the gradient automatically by looking at this parameter. This is a normal PA pressure, systolic, diastolic, and if you combine it with the RV pressure waveform, you can also see in diastole a gradient. This is the PA pulse pressure, and you all know the PAPI is basically the pulse pressure divided by the CVP, or the right ventricular and diastolic pressure. And there's a large amount of literature showing the prognostic value of the PAPI. If you have RV dysfunction, what will happen is your systolic pressure will go down, the PA pulse, the pulse pressure will be reduced, and you're gonna have an increase in your diastolic PA pressure. In addition, what will happen is that gradient between and diastole between the RV and the PA will be reduced. And uh, so, uh, and at one point you'll see what can happen if the, the RV and diastolic pressure becomes higher than the PA pressure. The PAPI is reduced because your pulse pressure is reduced and your RVDP or your CVP is high. Well, let me show you an example. This is a patient, 54 year old, unstable, after cabbage and EVR. First thing you notice and something I discussed yesterday is that in red you have the femoral, in pink you have the radial artery pressure. So these unstable patients often have unreliable radial artery pressure. And why is this patient unstable? Well, you see it, there's ST changes from air emboli into the RCA. But when you look closely at the right ventricular pressure waveform, what you will see in yellow, that's your PA pressure, but in green, this is the RV pressure. And at one point during diastole, the right ventricular and diastole pressure will be higher than the PA pressure. And the consequence of this is that an echocardiographic sign that you will see, which is the opening of the pulmonic valve in diastole, okay? And this is a unique sign of significant RV dysfunction and RV failure. And the way to demonstrate this, you can see it on 2D, but you can also put a pulse wave Doppler and you can see the positive sign in diastole that the pulmonic valve is opening. And this is not something new, it's been described 40 years ago, mid-diastolic opening of the pulmonic valve after right ventricular infarction in Jack in 1985. Next step is what's the significance of the systolic RV pressure waveform. So normally you may have a small gradient between the systolic RV pressure and the systolic PA pressure. Typically it should be less or equal to six millimeter of mercury. In some patients, you can observe a gradient, a gradient in which this gradient, the PA, the systolic RV pressure will be higher than the systolic PA pressure. Okay? And we define a normal gradient more than six millimeter of mercury. So this is an example where you can see an hyperdynamic heart. What you have in green is the P, right ventricular pressure and in yellow, the PA pressure. And you can see there's a gradient here close to 20 millimeter of mercury. This gradient, you can so also see it on echocardiography. You can see the mesesophageal inflow outflow track, and you can see the collapse of this uh, structure, and you can see it also in 3D. 
When it's very severe, more than 25 millimeter of mercury, which we described several years ago, up to 4% of cardiac surgical patients can have this, it's called a suicide right ventricle. And this is typical of patient in which the contractility of the RV is increased significantly or the afterload of the RV is significantly reduced. And the best example is after long transplantation or you have an hyperdynamic, a normal RV, but you significantly are reducing the, uh, the afterload. And these, this is where, this is the typical population in which this phenomenon has been described. So the most recent study uh, on this topic was reported uh, last year by Etienne Couture in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology. And basically we were able to record systematically uh, those gradients. So what we found in 400 patients is that the presence of a gradient across the outflow track before and after bypass is from 30 to 47%. The good news is that overall, if you have such a gradient, it's typically associated with an increase in your cardiac output. However, when you have it before bypass, it's typically associated with the use of inotropes or the use of inhaled vasodilators. So basically the two mechanism that they can produce this gradient. If you have it after bypass in our population, typically associated with intratracheal marinone, tachycardia, reduced fluid balance, and longer cardiopulmonary bypass. Overall, the good news is that if you have a gradient, there's not necessarily an increase in what we call the post-op organ dysfunction. And this is basically what prevents a patient from leaving the ICU, vasoactive drugs, intubation, for instance. However, those who have it before bypass, they had increased post-op renal replacement therapy, those who had it after bypass had an increase in the duration of vasoactive support. This is an example. This is a case we reported from the PACEPORT study, where you have a patient who has difficult aspiration from bypass after a cabbage and an AVR, and you can see the gradient after bypass. So this is before, this is after bypass. In that study, we were able to record continuously the value of the gradient. So after bypass, at 11.33, we give five milligrams of intratracheal mirinone. And you can see there's a significant increase in the right ventricular alpha track obstruction, the gradient increase, which persists up to five hours into the intensive care unit. Interestingly also, you can notice also that the RVDPDT, but also the LVDPDT also increase in those patients, indicating that the administration of intratracheal mirinone as an effect not only on the right ventricle, but also on the left ventricle. And again, you can see on the RV that it lasts up to five hours. So in summary, this is how we understand actually the concept of right ventricular dysfunction. So how does the right ventricular pressure waveform fits? So if you have an outflow track obstruction, you're really talking about an issue of pressure overload. When you start driving RV dysfunction, what you're gonna see mostly is you're gonna see a change in the diastolic slope. Instead of being horizontal, it's gonna be oblique. And when you have RV failure, you're gonna see a square root sign, and in some patient, an opening of the pulmonic valve during diastole. Thank you for your attention.